Hi, uh, I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about two things, olive kitteridge and endings. Endings are tough. Um, okay, so this module, you are getting into our third and final collection, olive kitteridge. In many ways, I've saved the best to last. Olive Kitteridge is a wonderful collection, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. It's as different from uh, Dubliners and Drown as Drown and Dubliners were from each other. <laughs> so uh, it's very, very different. Um, in Olive Kitteridge, we have an eponymous common protagonist, as you probably figured out from the title, right? We don't see Olive Kitteridge in every story. That is to say, we don't ride around in her head. She's not the main character in every story. Although she appears in one form or another in almost every story. So in some stories, she's a minor character. Um, and in other stories, she's like just mentioned in passing. But she's kind of always there, you know. Um, it's interesting. Elizabeth Strout chose this particular genre uh, because, she says, because of the power of Olive Kitteridge as a character. She's such a strong character, uh, Elizabeth Strout didn't want to overwhelm the reader with her, and so chose to use the short story cycle as a way of giving all of Kitteridge to the reader in bits and pieces, kind of like black pepper, right? Black pepper is wonderful in small amounts, but too much, and it's, it's overwhelming. How wonderful to develop a character as strong and complex as all of Kitteridge. Um, what's interesting about getting a common character like Olive Kitteridge within this cycle is that we get to see her from so many angles. We get to see her from inside her own head when she's the uh, narrator of the story or the, com or the protagonist. We also get to see her through the eyes of her husband when he's a character, or he's one of the main characters, through the eyes of her son and through the eyes of some of the folks in the community. The common setting is a small town in Maine, Crosby, Maine. Um, so that's where most of the action takes place, although not all of it. Um, so this is really interesting. Uh, this, I think, um, demonstrates the power of the short story cycle to do things with a complex character that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Olive Kitteridge is a big enough character to fit a novel. So Elizabeth Strout could have done the traditional novel genre with this character, but she didn't. Instead, she did something which personally I think is much more complex. We get to see this character from multiple angles. And so as a result, I think we're never entirely sure about um, who this character really is. Now, we know who she is. Let me rephrase that. Because we see her from so many different angles, the truth about all of Kitteridge's nature is hard to pin down. Just like the truth of a real person is hard to pin, hard to pin down, right? None of us can be fit into pigeonholes. And it's the same way with this character. You can't pigeonhole her. And I really like that. And that's the kind of complex character that I hope all of you are developing. Okay, so um, all of Kitteridge wonderful novel and I'm looking forward to reading your discussion forums when you start talking about her. Um, so endings. Endings are really hard. How do you end a short story effectively? This is something I struggle with continually and so I'm always taking extra note of how an author ends his or her short stories. James Joyce chooses to end often, although not always, with an epiphany. If you recall, an epiphany is that moment of, you know, um, the, the character makes a realization, comes to a recognition about some aspect or truth about his or her nature that was previously undisclosed or unrecognized. So we have a great example of that in the short story, Araby. I have all three of our books on my lap, so I've got to find them. So Araby, if you'll recall, was um, the short story about the young man who has a crush on the girl next door. He goes to the bazaar, wants to buy her a gift. The bazaar is closed already or is in the process of closing down. And the story concludes with this flash of insight about how he you know, perceives himself. It's just very short, 
it says gazing up into the darkness i saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity and my eyes burned with anguish and anger isn't that wonderful driven and derided anguish and anger and there's of course joyce using language in his own inimitable way but it ends with an epiphany right um, I would say this, that uh, a short story is a world in itself, right? We know that. It's got a beginning, it's got a plot where something happens, and it's got an ending. And that ending needn't be resolution in terms of, oh, everything's fine now, everything's wrapped up in a nice little bow, but it should have, there should be a sense of closure, because remember, that short story is its own self-contained world. We go into it, and then we come out of it. And when we exit that short story, it's done with. So you do want to give your reader a sense of, um, some sense of closure that things have come to an end or that, that, that a line has been drawn. I don't really like that expression. That's not what I'm trying to say. But there should be a sense of finality. Okay? Diaz actually does that very well. I was thinking that Diaz just kind of, leaves us you know he just ends his stories and maybe he does for some of them but pretty much he does offer a sense of closure i want to direct your attention to a really nice example and that was with the short story aurora okay many of you commented on aurora you really liked it aurora if you'll remember was the short story about lucero the drug dealer, right? We weren't in Junior's head for this one. We were in Lucero, the drug dealer's head. And he is, the short story is about his relationship, on and off relationship with his girlfriend, Aurora. They're really besotted with each other like this, right? And yet they can't really stick stick together. Like They're like oil and water. I don't know. They're obsessed with each other, but it's explosive. Okay, so the the final paragraph is really great as an ending. Let me read it to you and then I'll explain what I think is uh, what I what I think is working with it. She ran her nails over my side. A week from then she would be asking me again, begging actually, telling me all the good things we do. And after a while I hit her and made the blood come out of her ear like a worm. But right then, in that apartment, we seemed like we were normal folks. Like maybe everything was fine. Okay, so did you catch what Diaz does here? He is giving us a moment with detail, and then he shifts into future tense. He says, a week from now, this is what's going to happen. But for now, things are good, like maybe everything is fine. And of course, we're not buying it. We know things aren't fine. He's just told us what's going to happen a week from then. That's kind of a cool trick, right? To step out of the temporal moment and shift into future tense, right? Say, this is what's going to happen. But for now, this is where we are. That's kind of a cool strategy for an ending. I just wanted to point that one example out. Um, Elizabeth Strout, in my humble opinion, is a fantastic writer. She won the Pulitzer for this piece, obvious, this particular collection. But she is also a master of the beautiful ending, giving us this wonderful, rounded, complete satisfaction of an ending. Doesn't mean that everything is good. It doesn't mean that everything is now going to be perfect for the characters. In fact, sometimes just the opposite. But she's able to deliver that sense of closure and satisfaction. I want to read to you my very most favorite ending. It's in the second story, the story Incoming Tide. In this story, uh, we are not in all of Kitteridge's head. We're actually in the head of a young man who has come back to Crosby, Maine to commit suicide. And as he is sitting in his car uh, in a parking lot that is right by um, the ocean, kind of a, sh a short cliff down to the water, he's sitting in his car, he's got the rifle in the back seat, he's thinking about his life, and who should come along? <laughs> and get into the car with him, but all of Kitteridge. And they have a wonderful conversation. Um, he notices a young woman that he remembers from his childhood. Okay, spoiler alert, but this is just one story. Um, and she uh, falls, she slips and falls into the waves. 
and he immediately forgets about his own problems and plunges into the water after her. Okay, so that's where the short story ends. How's that for an ending? They're both in the water. They might drown. That's where she ends it. But she gives us a fantastic ending because of how she delivers it. And I want to read you this last paragraph. He would not let her go, even though staring into her open eyes in the swirling, salt-filled water, with sun flashing through each wave, he thought he would like this moment to be forever. The dark-haired woman on shore calling for their safety. The girl who had once jumped rope like a queen, now holding him with a fierceness that matched the power of the ocean. Oh, insane, ludicrous, unknowable world! Look how she wanted to live. Look how she wanted to hold on. Isn't that amazing? That's how she ends it. So, um, so what she does is actually she does something a little bit similar to Diaz. She steps out of the literalness of the moment into something else. Diaz stepped out of the literalness, literalness of the moment into the future. She steps out of the literalist moment, literal, uh, I'm having trouble with that word, into this into his mind where he is suddenly seeing something bigger than the actual trauma they're experiencing. I guess you could say it's kind of like an epiphany. Kind of, maybe. I don't know. But the poetry is beautiful. There's a real po poetic aspect to it. I'm interested in getting your thoughts on this. Let me share with you, this is almost 12 minutes long, this video, and I'm very sorry. I don't mean to make them so long. Let me share with you one last tip. Uh, I struggle with endings too. One strategy that occasionally works very nicely is when I'm working with maybe a third or fourth draft of a story and I've gone through maybe a couple of endings that are not very good, I sometimes go back and look for that, um, what one author calls the load-bearing sentence. Sometimes it's not just one sentence, but it might be like a, a group of sentences might be a small paragraph, where I've just, it's just perfect. I've just captured what I'm trying to do in that story. There's a poetry to it, maybe, or there's a tension, and I pull that out and make that my ending. Of course, you've got to go back and rewrite stuff to make sure it makes sense, and it doesn't always work, I should warn you, but sometimes it does work. And um, so that's one strategy you might think about. But certainly endings are challenging, and that might be something to uh, ask your workshop group for help with. And also, as you read through all of Kitteridge, take note of how Elizabeth Strout crafts her endings, how she gets there, and how she frames them. Because in my opinion, she is a master of endings. Uh, well, thank you, and I'll be talking to you soon. Happy reading and reading.